And early in my adult life, when I started talking about it, uh, my parents weren't real sure. Yeah, I bet. They weren't real sure about it. But the more I talked, the more they understood. Mm -hmm. Finally, when when my, uh, my dad on his deathbed, he couldn't talk, but he had a stroke, but couldn't talk, but I know he was listening. So I just talked to him and I said, you know, Dad, I, I know you can't talk, but I'm going to tell you my near-death story again, because <laughs> I just like talking with you. And I told him the whole story again. And uh, so I told him, Dad, when you pass on, it's not a terrible thing. Actually, you're going to enjoy it very much. Mm -hmm. And I said, when you get up there, when you separate from your body, you go up there, you're going to see your grandparents again. All those friends and relatives that you missed all these years, they're waiting for you. And it's going to be a celebration, I promise. Mm -hmm. Just hang on, Dad. It's going to be okay. And, you know, I didn't know for sure, but he seemed to understand. Mm -hmm. He died like a champion. Oh, beautiful. He, he laid there. He, I, I saw his weakness when I was a kid, so I wasn't so sure he's going to be able to handle it. But he laid there in bed, and it was like when it was time to go, he was like, take a breath. Please. You got to accentuate the positive. Wow! I feel good. A little bit of feel good goes a long way. You're listening to Karen Swain, teacher of deliberate creation, accentuating the positive, showing you a way to a better life. Accentuating the positive, it's not just fad, it's sanity. Who in their right mind would accentuate anything else? If you feel like that's what you want to do. Hello and welcome to another show, Accentuating the Positive with Karen Swain. As always, wonderful to be with you again. I have a lovely, beautiful man all the way over there in the States. A lot of people I speak to are in the States to introduce you to. His name is Kenneth Lett. Welcome to the show, Kenneth. Thank you. Now, I'm Kenneth honored. was... Um, Kenneth was uh, somebody on the YouTube, and I can't remember who. I thought it was Linda, but I asked her this morning. It wasn't Linda. I'm sorry if I forget your name, said. Have you heard of Kenneth Curran? And I checked him out, and I thought, wow, you are fascinating. So please remember to subscribe if you're enjoying the conversations and like and uh, press that notification buttons if you want to be updated. I'm doing a lot more shows at the moment. There's just so much to talk about. We are in these wild times, aren't we, crazy times? So I'm doing some Facebook Lives each week and then upload those as well which you'll see as my last upload was a Facebook live I did with Barbara Jean. Now uh, Kenneth has an amazing story and I'm going to read a little bit of it through his bio and then we're going to get into it because there's so much to talk about and it's kind of even more pertinent to what we're going through now don't you think? Yes very much so. Okay, Kenneth Lett had a profound near-death experience when he was eight years old, when he became aware of his existence outside his body during an operation. At first, he found himself in a dark and isolating environment with several dark spirits, but then an angel came to rescue him. Upon entering a higher realm or heaven, he was introduced to multiple relatives that had passed before he was born. He met an entity in the form of a woman who gave him a tour of heaven or a tour of that particular aspect of heaven or realm, uh, explaining to Kenneth how his family went back multiple generations, Kenneth's family. Later, she introduced him to what she called her son, known as Jesus on earth. Kenneth recalls him saying he was the Alpha and Omega. And this is where you say, this part of my story was received well by those into their structured religion. He says, you say, my experience moves on to challenge common faith amongst Christian religions. I was shown a copy of the Bible and a voice explained how many Entries in it were false and not recorded accurately. I know that most religion is based in false interpretation. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that yeah challenges people in, in, in religion. Kenneth was born in 1955 in the 98th Meridian. What does that mean? Meridian, central Nebraska. Oh, that's um, the, the grid for the... Oh, who put the grid together? If you ever 
look at a globe, you'll see there are lines, latitude and longitude. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. the 98th meridian goes from north to south. Oh, and okay. So it's just a few miles off to the side, about 30 miles. Oh, okay. Anyway, magnetically, magnetically, it's supposed to be um, energy producing and it helps people center, apparently. Oh, beautiful. I couldn't tell you. Okay. Yeah. So you live in a, a country house in a tiny village that was established by homesteaders in the late 1800s. Many of your distant family are buried there and you live in the only remaining house. There is a quaint church across the street that the local people maintain as a museum. <laughs> and yeah. there is also an old dance hall community centre building still standing that the neighbours used to celebrate the June 5th independence of Denmark, you say. Mm -hmm. So yes, this is a Danish settlement and my last name is Danish, is a Danish one. It's spelt L-E-T-H, but it's pronounced let. It's a Danish thing, you say. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Kenneth receives many visions of the future during his out-of-body experience and you say here my experience took me to the future of the United States I guess it was shown to me because I was I expressed an interest in seeing the future I had no idea mm -hmm. it would be so stark and horrifying I saw the downfall mm -hmm. of the US and most current political events fit into what I recall I guess that makes me a kind of a prophet you say so this was a while ago, you know, when you were eight and that future you were shown, I suspect is kind of, has happened mostly. Mostly you were shown, like when you were shown the future, were you shown what is now our past or were you shown beyond this time? They showed me some of the past, but it was just because I expressed an interest in it. Um, they brought me up to a, a, a globe that looked a lot like the earth. Mm. But I was I understood that it was a machine, and it was very intricate, and it had it was set up on a pedestal. It was very large. Mm -hmm. um, it had streaks of light going around it. It, it appeared mechanical at first. Mm -hmm. uh, later, it was explained when I saw a streak of light uh, leaving the planet, going out into space. I was told that's when somebody important or somebody very spiritual dies. And their spirit leaves the planet and goes on a journey a little for heaven. So um, I saw things moving on it even before they zoomed in, um, before they zoomed in to give me any more detail. It started actually, I wanted to know where I, the reason why they showed me the future is because I first I asked, where do I fit in? Mm -hmm. I'm from this planet. So where's my time and where do I fit in? And they found it. And as soon as they located it, then like a vision opened up away from the globe and I could see things. And they asked if I wanted to see my future. And I said, yes, not knowing, like you said, it was going to be stark. And the very first thing I saw was the assassination of our president, JFK. Oh, wow. Wow. So he was the president yeah. at the time that you had the NDE. He he died a couple of weeks later. Okay. All right. He, mm -hmm. I was in recovery. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, hang on. Let's kind of go back and let's have a, a look at what happened to you when you were eight. Let's kind of start start there. I mean, obviously, here it's been a couple of years since you were eight, but you seem to have like this mm -hmm. full recall and probably over your life, you've recalled more and more and more and more, like it gets clearer and clearer the older you get. It doesn't get more distant, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So let's have a little uh, listen to what happened to you at eight and we'll go from there. Uh, it was an appendix. It was so, in a, um, Sorry, the internet's append a bit on. Uh-oh, it was my appendix. Use your appendix. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but they, my parents didn't understand what was going on. It appeared to be the flu. Mm -hmm. um, and they explained that they called the doctor and told him over the phone what was happening. And he confirmed that it sounded like the flu. So they kept me home. And like a week and a half later, I was so pale. I looked like I was half dead. Mm. 
And uh, my mother finally took me to a doctor. And then as soon as he saw me, he knew something was serious was wrong. So he ordered an immediate operation. I, like within, well, half an hour, an hour. It's been a long time ago, but it was quick. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother drove me quickly to the hospital. It was only a few blocks away. And the nurses started shaving my tummy, which I thought was ridiculous. I was a little boy. <laughs> but they had a razor and shaving cream, and they're shaving my belly. And I was like, why are you doing that? And they just said, well, we have to cut you open. That was when I was like, what? <laughs> I couldn't believe it. But And then they put me on a gurney and Zoom. I was, I was in the operating room in no time. So the doctor understood that my appendix had been bad for like a week, a week and a half. So they were afraid it would burst. Um, as it turns out, it had already. Oh, like wow. Maybe. I remember I it happening the day before. Yeah. yeah wow. So, you know, all the, all the junk in there was loose. And... Yeah, I do. Yeah. I've, I've, you know, studied as anatomy and physiology. I know exactly what's going on in there, but anyway, we won't go into the gory details here. Yeah, so, yeah, they're, yeah. <laughs> so they're trying to clean you up. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. But they put me under with ether, which I had no concept of what was going to happen next. And, and it was a small town hospital. They didn't have the anesthesia like they do now. So ether was used. Hmm. I remember laying on the table, they covered my face with a kind of mask, and then a, like a cloth was put over that, and then some sort of fluid was put on the cloth, and then they told me to, to breathe real big, deep, like um, I was blowing up a balloon. And then the nurse made it like a contest. Come on, you can blow harder, you know. And, I, and it stunk. It was awful. And next thing I knew, my head was spinning. I could feel my body stationary on the table. My head was loose and orbiting just like the moon. And then like that, I was gone. And it was just nothing but black. So that's when I... I finally came to a form of consciousness where I realized I was outside my body. Mm -hmm. And um, I do remember a voice of some kind speaking to me and it was full of authority and it was like, do you want to live or do you want to die? Mm -hmm. And I said, I want to live. And then it was like agreed to. And then I just sort of, gaining form to a point where I could understand it was me, but it was wispy. Mm -hmm. So then I understood it. I was my spirit. But somehow, somehow I was still attached to my body. There was like a cord going from me down to my body, mm -hmm. and a long silver cord. I call it a tether. Mm -hmm. And I could see other spirits rising up and moving on, going to heaven. I understood that they were dead people. I knew that somehow, mm. but they didn't have a cord and I did. Mm. So I don't understand why that happens, but it did. Mm. So I imagine I was supposed to go on up, but I couldn't because of the cord. You were tethered. That's why to the, the angel body. had to come. Yeah, interesting. So you met a couple of nefarious, <laughs> cheeky spirits. That were oh, yeah. trying to convince you of their perspective. What what were they saying to you? Uh, they mocked me. Mm -hmm. um, to them, I was weak, I was silly, immature. Well, not so much immature. They were young too, mm -hmm. but I was weak. To them, I was weak, and I would back away from them, and I would say, "Leave me alone." And then they would imitate me and giggle. I'd say, leave me alone. And they'd go, leave me alone. And then they'd laugh. But eventually they got brave and they started to swoop past me and hit me. And I would spin and the tether kept me in place. I couldn't, I couldn't stop it. It was, it, it was pretty terrifying. I didn't cry. I was just, I was just very frightened.
So well, that's when I called out for help. Okay, but you're, you're still, you know, you're eight years old. You're still in your eight-year-old idea, right? You're still thinking you're like this little kid, this little eight-year-old. You sort of haven't left your body and then, oh, I'm a soul. You're still kind of convinced you're a little kid. Yeah. yeah. That's how I communicated with them as a child. Yeah. Which they, they thought was hilarious. Yeah. I, I think... Now that I'm older and I think about it, I was a lot more powerful than I understood. Yeah. I probably could have gotten rid of them real easy, mm -hmm. but I didn't know how. Mm -hmm. It was when I called out for help and I said, please God, I was heard somehow. It was like the word God was powerful. As soon as they heard me say that, gone. They flew off. They were scared. That's when the angel came. So, and he was beautiful, wonderful. <laughs> he was full of love and he glowed and um, he comforted me. I'm a friend. And, um, Sorry, that we <clears throat> not have a great connection. He comforted you and what did he say? He comforted you and said what? He, he comforted me and um, he just spoke to me like, we were on earth and like an adult would talk to a kid okay. and it was like, well now, who are you and what are you doing here? And what's going on? Let's just figure this out. And I'm here to help, you know, that sort of thing. I was like, so grateful. I was just like a kid in the playground. I was being picked on. That's what I felt like. Yeah. Sounds like that. Well, yeah, yeah. as I, you know, as you're talking, I'm getting all these messages about why this happened to you. Um, you know, every experience we experience, whether in the physical body or in another realm, is for the benefit of the evolving soul or the evolving consciousness of the body. And maybe you needed to know that as a kid, that even when people pick on you, there's help there and you are powerful. But anyway, go on. <laughs> or in a previous life, I was just a horrible bully. Maybe. Maybe I needed, maybe I needed to find out. Although I do have, in my previous video that you watched, I did not talk about my previous life too much. I do have memories of it now. Okay. And uh, you were showing sure that I was a young man. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's becoming more solid. It's coming back. Okay. Um, the more I focus on those types of things, I ask myself, I go to sleep. You know, what about my previous life? Can I remember anything about it? And then I go to sleep. Sometimes I have dreams and little bits of information come to me and I remember. Right. But I know now that I probably lived in northern France and it was very green. Uh, I believe it was in the Middle Ages. So it would have been after uh, Rome collapsed. Hmm. Uh, very possible I was blonde. I had a wife, I believe, and I believe there were kids. And the whole family lived in like a very simple structure. There was a lot of dirt and straw involved. And um, either somebody was angry with me and attacked me and I died, or I got sick and I died. I think I got sick. Um, it could have been the plague. Mm -hmm. I, remember, I remember people... <laughs> I was laying on the floor and I couldn't get up. And it seems like my wife or my sister, my mother didn't want to leave me, but they had to. So they left me alone and I died in that house alone. So they probably had to leave to protect themselves. Wow. So interesting considering what we're going through at the moment. Uh, yeah. So you saw yourself as a bit of a bully in that life? You're a bit of a... Well, I know I had an argument with somebody. Uh -huh. but not, too, not too far from the house, there must have been a river. I wonder if it wasn't the Rhine. That would have been northern France. But um, there was a river close by and I was with some people out and it looked like reeds. Very tall reeds. So they would have been used for... Um, you know, housing, stuff like that. And 
we were out there working. We went out there frequently, it seems. They were out there, and then I had an argument with somebody. And I don't know if it was my wife or it was somebody else. I can't recall. I don't know. Mm. Well, mm. okay, well, let's get back to your story. So you uh, were rescued by this angel who was beautiful and male and treated you like a child, like, what you doing yeah. here? And then you, didn't you say to him that you couldn't kind of move and he helped you move? Yeah, I, he asked me how come I wasn't going up like all the other spirits. Because mm -hmm. they, were, they were moving up around me all the time. And they always looked older, like grandparents. And um, so he wanted to know how come I was still stuck there. And I tried to jump, and he could see that the tether was holding me back. And so he had a long, flowing robe, and he glowed. A very Christian angel. He had a, a sword on his shoulder, a strap, and I believe he had a horn. Uh-oh, internet connection. Okay, there we go. He had a horn and a, a sword. And then I, I remember asking him about them. Oh, here's something I didn't say in the previous video. Was that uh, he had the ability to look in my past life. And he picked out a time when um, I was in church and I was really little. In Sunday school, we were in the front up the altar. And we were singing, Jesus Loves Me. And I mean, the words wrong. And another little boy next to me kept grabbing my arm and saying, no, no, you're singing it wrong. And then he'd try to correct me in front of the whole congregation. And the older people were just laughing and loving it. Um, and then before the angel did much with me, he had me sing it for him. I gave him a little... Uh, I mean, what you call it, just a little service, I guess, and I sang for him, uh, Jesus Loves Me. I can't remember the words anymore. But, you know, <laughs> but anyway, I, I sang it for him a little bit. He thought that was great. And then he decided, well, we're going to have to send you on up like the others because it looks like your operation isn't done. I think at first he was just kind of, he was just babysitting me to see if he could keep me company and safe until the operation was over. But then he looked down and he realized it wasn't going so well. And so he took out his sword and he, he cut the tether. And he put me in a bubble and protected me. And it was big enough that I had room to move around. And he said, now this is going to float you up where all the others are going and I have to leave. I can't stay with you anymore. So that's what he did. But I remember when I asked him about the sword and, and horn, I asked him, what are they for? And he said, well, someday God is going to ask me to use them. It's not yet, though, but the day is coming. So he took you up in a bubble. He put you in a bubble and you kind of, did you float? Did you raise? I don't know. So you had the experience of moving upwards <laughs> yeah. and going to another realm. Uh, did you... I'm thinking about those bubbles that you can get, you know, they're like plastic. As, as this thing happens with the panic pandemic, I've seen lots of memes of people going out on dates in these plastic bubbles. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I'm, I'm th getting that image of you in this sort of see-through plastic bubble. That's what it was, see-through. Was it, yeah, yeah kind of. Uh, and so when you arrived at your destination, did it sort of like burst, like a bubble would burst? That's, that's weird. Yeah, I, I floated free in space, and I saw a lot of stars. I could mm -hmm. see the earth below. Then I noticed that I was stuck in a channel. There were multiple channels leaving the earth, and they were full of people, and I was in one of them. Mm -hmm. And I could hear people talking around me, and they were in other languages. I didn't understand. Okay, so I went up through the tunnel, the tunnel was a little bit bumpy, up and down, but it was fun. And it was full of color, beautiful, full colors, like emerald green and royal blue. Nice. And, you know, deep, rich yellow. And let's see, after the end of the tunnel, 
I just floated free, went up, and I just gently bounced off a barrier. It was like a cloud. And I just sat up there, and it was like a cloud. I'm sorry, my clock is banging. Um, so I just sat there for a minute, and I was like, well, what am I going to do next? And a hand reached down, an arm reached down through the barrier, grabbed me by the shoulder, and yanked me up. And then I was there. I was through the barrier, and I was up. And I was standing, and there was a man who I had no idea who it was. But from sharing the story with my parents, I'm pretty sure it was my uh, my dad's uh, cousin. Um, and he had died in the Korean War just like two or three years before he was born. And um, so he was a close, a, a favorite cousin of my father. So apparently before the angel set me up, they somehow knew how I was attached by family, but they weren't told I was coming. Somehow, you'd think they would know, but uh, this man didn't know who it was. Uh, of course, he died before he was born. But then uh, he said, well, okay, I have relatives just up over here. Let's go talk to them. And he took me. And there was like two older couples, and they kept talking to him. I didn't understand them. And finally, um, one of them said, what is your name? And I said, I am Kenneth. I am Kenneth Lett. Well, they understood the last name. Mm -hmm. And they go, oh, so who is your father? And I said, Lyle. And then the older women, oh, my goodness, your father is our grandson. Oh. And that's when I understood, that's when I understood that it, that would have been my great-grandparents. Nice. Because yeah. both of my dad's parents were still living. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the connection they made was through my dad and not my mother. Although when I went through my life review, I did see grandparents on my mother's side. I saw them in some of my review. Um, lovely people. Um, and they love kids very much. So they played with me and I got to see it. So at eight, you had a life review. And what did you find out about your little eight-year-old life in that life? <laughs> in this life? This life, that life, this life. Well, I know. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I had kind of a, a thought there for a moment. Well, when I was interviewed by uh, <laughs> Trisha, I didn't tell her how I was scolded just a little bit. <laughs> um, there was an incident in my garage when I was little. I don't know why, but um, I would take my friends in that garage and I would pull down my pants. And, uh, <laughs> that was there. <laughs> oh, God, I did that when I was uh, like about four or five, too. I think all little kids oh, didn't are we all? like it fascinated like with that. their genitals. <laughs> like, why don't I have one like you? Anyway, go on. <laughs> yeah, kind of stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had a favorite girl cousin I did that with a lot, but I don't know why. She doesn't think much of me now, so <laughs> who cares? <laughs> But um, <laughs> um, that was shown. And then um, there was an incident, though, that was serious. And that was when I'd lost my temper with my brother. And he had a toy baseball bat, and it was wood. And, I don't know. It could have been more than a foot, foot and a half long. And he got so angry with me. I just, just tired of it. And he kept picking on me. And I just took the bat and wrapped him on top of the head. But it hurt him a lot more than I knew. And he cried and he cried. And then mother, the, the lady that gave me a tour guide up there, um, she kind of scolded me. And she said, now this is totally wrong. And you are to never injure another person. Never. You never hurt them. You never hit them. You do not hurt people. And so that I was known to be a bit of a wrestler. Um, to be competitive, I kind of like to fight a little bit when I, before my operation. Mm -hmm. After that, all that was gone. Wow. I became very timid when yeah. I came back. 
I'm just thinking about and, this as kids. Uh, I would not fight. You would not fight. Uh, when, when I, in my family, there was three of us. I was in the middle. We used to try and kill each other often. I'm just thinking if I had a life review, I would have been well and truly scolded. <laughs> we grew up in a very dysfunctional family, and so we saw our parents fight, and we oh. try and kill each other as well, like fighting, hitting, scratching, punching. Anyway, sorry, go on. It just reminded me, as I'm sure that it reminds other people of your childhood. So right, your mother said, but, yeah, you, mm -hmm. she said, don't do that. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I apologized to her. I, I told her, I'm, I understand now, I'll, I'll never do it again. And you know, the thing is that I never have. I've been in situations where, you know, people want you to fight back. Mm -hmm. They kind of set you up. They're testing you. Yeah. I still, to this day, I will not do it. Yeah. I'll just stand there and go ahead and pick on me if you need to, you know, but I will not fight back. Yeah. Wow. So, and that's Look considered powerful. weakness. That's considered a weakness to this day and age. Well, it might be in a man, you know, as a man, especially, you know, you're maybe a couple of years older than me, like growing up in that generation. Yeah, if you didn't fight back, you weren't considered manly. So, wow. That, yeah. 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 Mm. So, in my manhood has been challenged off and on throughout my life. Right. Um, so, yeah, but you know, why do people fight? It's, yeah, cause see, I, don't, I don't get into competition either. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. And gambling? Yeah, people fight because they're about? scared. That's dumb. It's fear, it's fear, fear, fear. All right, so what, what else did you see in your eight years on earth uh, from that well, review? The, those two little incidents that I described that were negative were very, very brief and really nothing. Everything else was very full of love and uh, appreciation and playfulness. And I, that's how I understood that I came from a great family. A lot of involvement with my grandparents who loved me very much. And uh, my mother came from a large family, so uh, she was one of the oldest. So I had aunts and uncles that are almost my age. Mm -hmm. So they kind of helped take care of me, and I played with them. And um, it was just great. I I got to see how much they loved me from another perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was really fun. And uh, so, when you're experiencing your life of you, was you know this um, being that you call mother, or you know as mother, was she? telling you why she was showing this to you or were you just being shown it and then all the reasons why were just coming to you like ah oh, like epiphanies you know nothing really was explained except for she wanted to show me the many generations of my family okay it was like i was given a tour mm -hmm. i've thought about this and you're, you're coming close with the right question and, and that is did you really die or were there circumstances there that they had to take care of you for a while? And that's what it felt like. It was almost like I was being babysat because yeah. when mother took me away from my other relatives. It was playful and it was like she would walk me as a toddler with my hand. Uh -huh. At times I was a baby and she held me in constant love. You know, as a mother would hold a child after they've nursed and yeah. they fall asleep, yeah, that loving comfort, that's what it felt like. Um, now, why she showed me all that, I, I didn't ask for it. Of course, then, how many people do we know who've had a near death where they asked or really had any control? I mean, it's like we're in their realm. So... Yeah, they well, do with us as they will. Yeah, look, having spoken to many people with many different near death experiences, there are many realms, you know, there are many realms. And uh, I had Peter Panagor yes. on recently, and he went to that realm of the absolute where he no longer exists as any sort of form of identity and sort of merged back into the, the oneness of all and had access oh, wow. to infinite knowing and, you know, like infinite, infinite 
knowing and infinite understanding at the same time he's like one with everything so he's no thing he's nothing but he's everything yeah. but he still kind of maintained a sense of identity yeah so there's many you know there's many realms that we can play in and like you said you're in this like babysitting realm like place where okay your body's you know we're doing some stuff with your body at the moment let's just take care of the consciousness that inhabits your body and show you a few things in this in the, in that particular well, realm yeah but they did they did take me beyond that and that was okay excuse cool. me the trigger was meeting jesus mm -hmm. um my family was represented through a tunnel of sorts and it looked like every generation of people that had gone before me occupied a level in that tunnel until I went back at 10 or 15 generations. Wow, interesting. The ones at the furthest end of the tunnel were close to an extremely bright light. Wow, interesting. And mother showed me yeah. that at the end there was a bright light and then she said, now look, the light's coming to see you. He's coming to say hello. Uh -huh. That was when a bright light suddenly came before me and it turned into a man. Yeah. And that's when she said, you may have been told on earth that his name is Jesus. Uh -huh. but this is my son. Uh -huh. Oh, I'm getting shivers. I'm getting all sorts of information about that. They were sort of showing you the evolution of consciousness through your genera through your family generation. Because as souls evolving through time and space, yeah, we come with different. I got places. the impression mm -hmm. that as each generation is born, mm -hmm. the earlier generations get moved closer to the light. Mm -hmm. is the way it looked mm -hmm. like we honor them by moving on and expanding the family and so i think that's well this is my interpretation i think that's why god tells us to go and be fruitful and be fruitful it, god tells us to go and be fruitful mm -hmm. to go and and uh you know have your own families and keep living that way and keep growing right grow your family Mm -hmm. I think it honors the generations that are before us, and they do, in fact, move closer to the light, which is very comforting. Um, then mm -hmm. Jesus said, I, I, need to, I need to take you. And so Mother said, go ahead with him. It's okay. She's always comforting. And I stood before him, and he transformed into that solid light. And then I heard this deep rumbling voice, and that's when he said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. He introduced himself. And I believe he said that in the Bible. Mm -hmm. He told his disciples that he was the Alpha and the Omega. Mm -hmm. But he said, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. And then he talked to me on a very personal level, like he knew everything about me. And I'm starting to remember some of it. Um, so Jesus, in fact, turned into God, is what happened. Now, the Christians say that he's the Son of God. Uh, we must go through Jesus to get to God. Well, Jesus basically was there. He took me. He expanded. He turned into a light. And then the form of Jesus was no longer there. Mm -hmm. Then I was in front of an incredibly bright light and a rumbling voice that was deep like God. So Jesus did, in fact, I believe, take me to God. Mm -hmm. And God talked to me like he knew me very well. And he said, you are my son. You are my child. And he says, you know Jesus? He was my son too. You are my son. Um, Jesus is your brother, is what he said. Um, the, he, God, I was in complete awe and wonder. I didn't know what to do. It, at times I felt like I wanted to shy away from him. He was so powerful. Um, but he, he gave me instructions, and I remember him saying that love was the most important thing there is. Mm-hmm. But he also, he also told me that um, I'm going to send you back to earth. You'll have to finish your life and never forget that I am your father. 
never forget. And he said, you're going to be, you're going to go through trials. You're going to be challenged. But through all of that, you must always remember that I love you. And I will take care of you. Mm -hmm. And that no matter what happens on earth, I'll always be up here for you. So there have been times in my life when, you know how sometimes your life will change suddenly. You got no control over it. It just seems like the worst thing in the world is happening. Well, I suspect a lot of I've people always, are feeling like that at the moment. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I've been through that, through my different jobs, mm -hmm. problems at work, where people always freak out that things are just coming undone. But I always knew that it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't always deal with it the best, but I always knew deep down inside I was going to be okay. Yeah. Isn't that a beautiful feeling of freedom? It's yeah. like no matter what happens, it all is well. No matter what happens. I could lose my well. job. I could lose my money. I could lose my health. I could lose my loved ones. I could lose uh, this thing called loss, but all is well. Mm -hmm. It's a potent message, one that many people have um, been sharing throughout time and space through religion and uh, many personal stories and, and spirituality and new age and in all walks of life and um, never more needed that at the moment. I think that you know, people are fearing more of the loss of their health and life. They're, fear, you know, they're losing work. They're losing their jobs, their livelihoods, their careers and yeah. But see, people like us, and I'm assuming you're you're very in tune to this because you interview people, but I don't know you personally. Have you done this too, the near-death thing? I, um, look, I am very connected to the other side. So mum dies when I'm a kid. Right. And she kept coming to me telling me there's no death. But what, what it's left me with is a feeling of why do people fight? Mm -hmm. I, I can see things on earth setting it up so that well, you've got to fight for this. You have to do, you have to make people understand what's right. Sometimes it ends up in the court of law. Sometimes it's based on somebody died unjustly mm -hmm. and now we go looking for justice. Mm -hmm. What I know is that there's no real justice on earth. It's like there's a game. And if you get involved in the game too deeply, it can swallow you up. Oh, God, yeah. So, Absolutely. And you can go to court, for example, and you can fight, and you can spend all that money and devote your life to anger and revenge. Revenge, just, But yeah. if you win in court, but if you win in court, do you get back what you lost? No, it doesn't take away your pain either. I watch this on television no. when... The murderers are, are, are sentenced and the families of the people they murdered are like, they're happy, gleeful that this person is getting his just deserves, but it doesn't take away their pain. You can't torture another yeah. to alleviate your pain. You just can't torture another yeah. enough. You can kill them, you can yeah. incarcerate them. Your pain is your pain. Anyway, um, you know, something that you said about the family generation, which I thought was fascinating. Uh, I, had, uh, I have a beautiful woman on the show called Frances Key. Uh, Francis Reiki and she her mother died in 2010 and she started downloading all this amazing you know she started talking to her mother um, started in a plane where she was looking out at the clouds going where are you now mother and then mother came through and downloaded these amazing books called the team books talking about our spiritual team and I, I I'm thinking of your experiences as your generation and it came to me that as you live your life outside of fear, outside of needing to revenge, outside of hate, oh, I'm getting big downloads about this, you're actually helping all your past generations, your team, if you like, uh, you're actually helping them be closer to the light. You're helping them with their karma, for a better word. You're, because you're, we are connected and, the, you know, we are one, as you evolve, those connections, which you call family or generations, they evolve along with you. That's what I felt when you were talking about seeing those, that lineage and being closer to the light. And um, yeah, you're not just doing it for yourself or your immediate physical family. You're doing it for that lineage and 
all those spirits and in a in some respect uh, you're giving them the option of not having to come back and have physical lives to evolve they're kind of evolving through you does that make sense like this is what Frances talks about when she talks about the team that um, we kind of we're doing it for the team <laughs> you know uh, where well, you know, in other other countries other cultures they're very in tune to the family and and honor mm -hmm. honoring the family like in japan for example mm -hmm. so yeah i can i can see it but i don't recall anything specific said about um that that um everything i say and do on earth is going to honor the family i of course then i was still in my eight-year-old you were eight yeah i mean you you're know. trying to interpret all this through an eight-year-old perspective uh, I think you're kind of doing pretty well, actually, interpreting it through an eight-year-old perspective. But I'm I'm assuming that the the spiritual team, your your mob up there, your friends, are showing you so that your eight-year-old perspective could have an understanding, like could have. Mm -hmm. And and I suspect that you were brought up in a religious sort of Christian background, so they are giving you mm -hmm. the, this understanding from that perspective. And um, yeah. Hmm. You know, the, the thing is, my, my mother was the Christian. <laughs> she made sure I went to Sunday school and we went to church. Mm -hmm. My dad reluctantly went along with it. All right. But I remember discussions at the table um, where my dad would just say, Ugh, all this stuff they're talking about, I can't relate to it. And he would say, what about the natives? <laughs> the Indians that were here before us and their religion where they respected the land. Yes. Because they were beautiful people. Yes. And why don't we recognize their religion? Exactly. Go dad. Course, my mother would go around and around with him. Oh, I bet. But I feel that way too. Well, it's interesting. Um, you say that only through me, can you get to God only through me, through Jesus? You know, I've had this conversation with a friend of mine who became a born again Christian when she was in her 20s or 30s. And she was trying to save everybody by getting them to believe in Jesus. And I was in the kitchen of my brother's house. And I think I lived there or he lived there. I can't remember anyway. And um, saying, well, what about all the Hindus and the Buddhists who don't know about Jesus or don't believe in Jesus? Are they not yeah. going to get to God or go to heaven too? And she's like, nope. You know, she was very adamant that only Jesus would take you there. And uh, the natives, you know, like, what about them? But I think that what we know is Jesus, as you saw that light, is that light of the what is called the Christ consciousness, which is that unconditional love. It's like, it's just what you said. It's like, I didn't want to fight people. Um, I didn't live in fear. Right. I, I felt completely held and loved and respected and honored and, you know, throughout all the traumas of my life. Um, unconditional love is that Christ consciousness. Uh, we can put Jesus's name on it, or we can put others, you know, names on it that have demonstrated that on earth, which have been many. Oh. And um, yeah, I believe every religion on earth worships the same being, yeah, the same creator. Mm. We, we put different names on it. Mm. I believe it's all the same creator. So they all, all honor the creator. And the light, what I understand is the way it penetrated, the light alone is life. Yeah. In the, spirit, the, in the spiritual form, you have no need for food and sustenance. That's so beautiful. But the light that emanates from that love completely sustains you, mm -hmm. completely re repairs you and heals you and builds you up. That's it's a tweetable incredible. moment. The light alone is love. The light love. The light alone is love. Uh, oh no, sorry, the light alone is life, you said. The light alone is life. Uh, you know, in the book Yogananda's uh, Autobiography of a Yogi, have you ever read that book by Yogananda? Um, he talks no. about a woman, an Indian woman, who lived many years ago, probably in the 19th century, uh, who was a fat, she was married off, as in the Hindu tradition, as a very young girl, 15 or something, and she was quite chubby, and her mother-in-law used to always berate her about her being chubby. So she went to the temple oh. and prayed to her particular god that, you know, they 
help her not be so chubby and or not be so into food and she was given this uh, download and this breath this sort of way of breathing um, this um, I'm, you know this exercise this I can't think of the word and she started practicing it and she stopped eating and she lived to a very old age and never ate again from that day never ever ate again and used to enjoy cooking for her family had many children and so she was known as a breatharian so she was known as a saint in her village and and she used to enjoy cooking but never ate anything and again she would just she was through the breath she was connected to that source of life that light and and sustained her physical body through that connection yeah isn't that amazing what a connection wow that's, now that's a connection <laughs> but that was her desire you know we don't all have i actually enjoy food probably a bit too much so i don't desire to be a breather <laughs> but that was her desire and she you know ask and you shall receive and she received what she asked for uh and we, yeah fascinating. that's amazing mm. Oh, I wish I could do that. Why? Don't you like food? Well, I, I love food. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> and I like my beer too. <laughs> you Corona beer? I shouldn't make a pun. <laughs> I, oh, I, was, I was saying on the last show that I've been, I've been craving Corona beer and, and people have been telling me on YouTube that the only beer left in the, in the shop is Corona. Nobody's willing to buy it. I thought that was funny. Okay, let's get back to this story. So Jesus, what else did they show you? I want to get into the, what they showed you about the future because that's the part of this that really fascinates me. I do believe there are many okay. probable futures and I've spoken to many people on the show who like you many years ago, you know, 50, some 60 years ago when they were children were shown probable futures of earth that were pretty disastrous. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. think to myself, we're all complaining about what we're going through now, but listening to some of those stories from people that were shown by either aliens or angels or, you know, inside there when they're in their physical body, having these sort of visions open up, um, that some of those probable uh, futures of earth were much worse than what we're experiencing now. Like, big earth changes and explosions and wars and really not good. So but I'd be interested to hear what you were shown about the future. Uh, after I was shown the JFK assassination, I asked, um, why? If, if this is, if God knows this is going to happen and this is a terrible thing, why is God going to allow it to happen? Mm -hmm. And they basically said, um, well, there's a couple of things they said. One was, your country is not as righteous as you like to believe. Okay. And the other is that our behaviors influence what comes after. And if we make some wrong decisions and we fight wars and we do it for the wrong reason and we injure people, there's consequences. Mm-hmm. And they didn't go into detail, but they said JFK's death is related to behaviors and things that were done in the past, and we can't interfere. Right. Mm -hmm. That's where our free will kicks in. Mm -hmm. So I, I was shown the future by another entity. It wasn't mother. Mm -hmm. This mother or this entity was more like a, it was a, it seemed to be female, but it was more structured and had kind of an attitude <laughs> um like a teacher okay yeah very structured and like if i tell you something you will know it and let's go on you know okay. it's like we got something to do here let's do it right okay um she had an attitude about the united states and um so all throughout all the future that she showed me she was like yeah, see, this bad stuff is going to happen, and this is kind of your own fault. Just because we're losing our focus. But from JFK, it was moved on. The visions moved and went to a time. They said, things are going to start changing a lot about this time. And I was shown the Supreme Court building um, in Washington, D.C. And they said, a ruling would take place here that would make some changes 
that will really set the wheels in motion. Um, the first time I was interviewed and I talked about that vision, I thought it had something to do with uh, legalizing gay marriage uh, because I was also told that um, all evangelist fundamental churches in America would have a real hard time with that ruling. So w when you were shown that time, what time was it? Did you know what state, like what year was it that that would happen? When you say uh, around maybe, this time, are you talking about our time now or in the past? Well, I'm talking about our time now. And okay. um, what I was told basically was when you're much older, yeah, these events will take place. So you weren't kind of given specific dates and stuff, yeah? No. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, they yeah. said when you see... When this ruling takes place, you will know it. So I'm pretty sure it was the um, the United States legalized uh, gay marriage. Gay marriage. Mm. It was about 2015, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and then they mentioned the fundamentalist churches, mm -hmm. how they would have a terrible, strong influence on our nation. Um, and then it moved to this last election we went through with Hillary Clinton and um, Donald Trump. And first they showed me that something was said about this election will take place toward the end of your strength and influence as a nation. Mm -hmm. So they showed this woman campaigning, speaking to crowds of people, and there was another president with her, and it was Bill. But Hillary was the one that really stood out. And they didn't tell me that there was anything wrong with her. Mm -hmm. But I listened to her speech a little bit, and I turned to the teacher and I said, well, she sounds all right. Uh, but she said, yeah, well, I don't think she'll get to lead, though. I don't think she'll win the election. That was said. Uh, it took me a while to remember that. But see, I just gave you some new information. So she, I was told she may not win. And then from there, I saw the oceans, a lot of turmoil, a lot of upheaval, uh, storms. But then eventually I did see a leader, a president, and I'm, I'm convinced it's Donald. And the man had blonde hair, and he was very disruptive. He had blonde hair? Would you call blonde Donald Trump's hair, hair blonde? That's a bit of well, a stretch. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's light. lighter now than it was maybe yeah. when he was younger, but yeah, it's always yeah. been a little bit light. Yeah, yeah. Well, right Are now you... it looks like cotton candy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and, and what were you showing about him? The little bit but he was a vile, angry, bitter, nasty man. That he caused a lot of disruption. That. Um, we would lose faith in our government because of him. And that's exactly what's happening. And then I was shown eventually a group of men. He was arguing, arguing within the government, and then a group of men came to him in the office, led him to the door, and pushed him out. And then this is going to happen. This is my prediction. This is going to happen. Uh, he's handling this virus thing so terribly eventually we're going to have to remove him so um he's pushed outside the buildings then he was holding a rally and shaking his fist and shouting and getting people riled up the americans Ooh, well this is I, very controversial because i have to say every time trump is uh, mentioned on any of the shows it brings up a lot of controversy there are a lot of people in the trump camp that think that he's he's the savior that he's living outside the um, control drama that the politicians have been under and that he might be vile and angry, but that he's actually shifting the system for the better. And there's a lot of people who just think he's a vile, angry, awful person, not following the rules and they don't like him. Anyway, there's a lot of controversy around Trump. Well, I, yes. And I did ask, well, how did this man come to be our president? And I was told, then I was shown a vision of, uh, I was coached and I was told about all these religions that supported him. And they're down in the south of America. They're fundamentalist, evangelistic. Um, they're not really worshiping God. 
they're building these great complexes. I saw I saw a lot of big buildings that they're building, and like their schools, and uh, their big churches, um, mm. that the leaders would live like lavish lives, lots of money, mansions. It's all happening. Yeah, there's um, a Netflix series on that. Uh, I can't remember what it's called, but yeah, mm -hmm. big money, big money inside. I was told not to trust them and not to follow them. Mm -hmm. um, they beg money from the old and the feeble, from the sick. They don't care. Just send us your tithing. The economy is in a complete chaos because of the virus. And they're telling people that if you stop your tithing, you're separating yourself from God. Oh, come on. I know. Well, a lot of fear and guilt. Break. Look, yeah, a lot of fear and guilt. But I have to say, as much as we can point at one particular uh, system or organization, there are many that use guilt um, to... Guilt, fear and shame. Guilt, guilt, fear and shame to sell their products, whether their product is God or, um, you know, plastic surgery or whatever the product is, diet, dietary stuff for women who feel guilt, fear and shame for being overweight or, you know, like there, that's a, there's a lot of that going on and we can't really point at one camp and say it's your fault. It's just rife on our planet, as, as I've said in many, in many shows and we're marinating in fear and, um, yeah, it's time for the fear to be alleviated, for the fear to stop, for people to come into their power and know that, as you did, all is well. Mm. All of these evil religions are based on one old, very old and incorrect belief that we are sinners. And I guess this goes, they believe this goes back to the garden. We have sinned and we must always pay for the sins that we do not deserve God's love and what I was shown is you automatically deserve God's love as soon as you're born you deserve God as soon as you enter this realm as soon as you're born you are loved you don't have to work for it it's there churches interfered they took that away churches say now you have to come to us. You have to go through our rules and our structures and our protocol, and you have to tithe and you have to do this. Um, then maybe God will love you then. Mm -hmm. They separate us from God's love. Mm. Well, I and remember when I was wrong. a kid, I grew up in a very non-religious family. Um, you know, we only went to church for christenings, funerals or weddings. And, uh, but as a kid, I remember hounding my mother with questions. How can a baby be born in sin? It doesn't make sense. A baby doesn't have sin. Why do they need to be baptized? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Like I'd run around the house hounding her asking questions and she'd go, oh, I don't know, Karen. I don't know, ask your father. And then I'd ask my father and he'd go, oh, I don't know, ask your mother. And I just used to hound them with these questions. This doesn't make sense. Tell me about this. This doesn't make sense. And yet religion was not really a topic discussed in our family, but I would hear it. Yeah. And I'd, and I'd come back to my parents and say, how is this right? It doesn't make sense. <laughs> my <Yeah>. poor parents. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So my mother, she, her, she, her sense of religion, she could not understand churches where people were always told that they're not acting humble enough. So when they would go to church, they would hang their heads and they would walk real slow always having to act humble before they entered the church. And if they acted up and got a little too happy or, you know, weren't being really quiet, that's a sin. And my mother would talk about them like, oh, they're so sad. Religion isn't supposed to make you unhappy. It's supposed to make you glad. Mm. Why are they so unhappy? She couldn't understand that. And I've kind of picked up on it and, I support it. I, I believe that's true. Um, we had a family that lived next to us. They had a, a mother that was really abusive. And uh, I remember one time my mom pointed out the window. The two little girls, about Easter time, were going to church. And it was hot out, very hot. But their mother had made them wear sweaters. Sweaters? Sweaters with long sleeves. Mm-hmm. 
hot furry sweaters in the heat and mm -hmm. they were walking to church and my mother was saying oh my god those poor girls they must be roasting in those sweaters she just wanted to go outside and take those sweaters off well after church they came over to play with me and my sister and my mom came outside and she goes let me take off your sweater you must be roasting let me take off your sweater she take off she took off this one little girl's sweater her arm was covered with bruises oh no from from being grabbed so hard by her mother that it bruised her arm oh. and her mother made her wear a sweater so the bruises wouldn't show oh wow let's see yeah she was very big into discipline discipline right. yeah. the way the church wants it mm. and anyway. was that really all necessary I don't think so. Well, you've got to think, you know, I wonder what she's going to see when she goes through her life of you. Okay, so when you were shown the future, were you shown past this time? Were you shown past the sort of Trump administration? And, um, yeah, I saw shown, my death. You sure? I you saw, saw your own death. death. Okay, so you knew how old you were going to be. Well, you probably didn't know your age, but you probably knew what you looked like. Right. Yeah. Well, I saw myself as a functioning man. Um, I saw myself as being a fairly strong character with strong convictions, which I have. Yeah. Oh, you get me in on social media talking politics and I'll go crazy. Just blah, 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 blah. <laughs> but whether or not it makes any difference, that's to be, I don't know, I'll find out later. We'll mm -hmm. find out. <laughs> but I also know it's a game. What, what I'm, what I feel very strongly is I know that people have been deceived and they believe many wrong things and they're actually hurting themselves. Um, that's what I try to communicate. Mm. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I got, maybe I got you off track. If you want to bring me back, I'll gladly help. <laughs> well, I was just wondering what else you were shown like future wise. Um, you did say that you saw a lot of earth changes. Look, I, I can, um, I can only say that when we're shown, you know, when people have been shown this sort of stuff when they were children, uh, obviously there's quite a lot of you that have been shown stuff. I've spoken to a few of you on the shows in various different circumstances, being children and being shown the future of Earth. You know, what's happening on the planet right now, we can complain about it and worry about it, but we came for this time. We're here, whether we're old or middle-aged or young or children, we came because we knew that these upheavals and this deception, um, there's, you know, not just religious deception, there's a lot of deception going on about what is happening right now. And regardless of that, there's a lot of stuff out there on the internet about who's controlling us and who's creating it and what's going on and the good, the bad and the ugly and the evil and everything. Regardless of all of that, we came to be a part of this time and to shine. And I had this, I was um, chatting to my mob, so I'm very connected to my spiritual team, which I call the mob or blissful beings. It's a prettier name that they gave me, uh, which I called my business blissful beings. And then one day they said, who do you think the blissful beings are? And I said, oh, it's you mob. Anyway, <laughs> they, um, they were telling me that, um, now I've lost my train of thought. What were they saying? Oh, it'll come back to me in a minute. You're but yeah. they were talking to me about your, your these mob. my mob. They're talking to me about these times and what and what we're doing here. Oh yeah, that's what they're saying. So you know, tra trauma happens during our history. Like we've had terrible people do terrible things. You know, love him or hate him, Trump's here, and you know there've been worse people that have been politicians that have done worse things in our in our history. But as a consciousness, as a collective consciousness, how have we dealt with it? And I was yeah. sort of asking the same thing as a collective consciousness, as the human mass consciousness, how are we dealing with this time? And um, your clock goes off every 15 minutes, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, you know, I probably could have shut that off. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay. It's kind of nice. And then they were showing me that there were enough people like you uh, people that were connected to the light, people that were bringing the light, call them star seeds, light weavers, I don't know, near-death experiences, experiences or ET experiences or light workers or whatever you want, difference makers, whatever you want to call them, you know, crystal children, light children, indigo children. There's enough of us 
on the planet right now to influence collective consciousness. Yes. And so, and not to get caught up in the deception and the path of anger and I'm being deceived and hate and there's enough of us. Right. And just looking on the internet, seeing people <laughs> makes me cry. Mm, you know, yeah. singing on their balconies in Italy and, and communicating. Wasn't that nice? You know, oh, yeah. and like, and just seeing my community in Sydney all on Zoom, all laughing and singing and loving and like, okay, we can't go outside according to the authorities, but so that doesn't stop us from loving and laughing and connecting. Yeah. And yeah. just this mass love that's happening, you know. So where yeah. do we want to put our focus? Do we want to put on the nefarious forces that are creating this control drama or do we want to look at the love that's expanding across the planet and that's what i was shown as i was yakking away to my mob last night that we are going to handle this <clears throat> very differently because of these beings on earth than we have handled trauma in the past and that it i believe all the trauma and disruption we're about to go through mm -hmm. in the u.s anyway is going to be traumatic even to the point of civil war. Mm -hmm. I believe that humanity in general is right on the cusp of elevating. All of humanity is on the cusp of becoming very much more spiritual so that we can overcome the pollution and the mm -hmm. crime and the sorrow. Mm -hmm. And when the deceit. We, as a, yes, as and a race. Lies. When we're mm -hmm. all connected together, we can pull heaven down and we can correct all of this mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we can stop it mm -hmm. right now i'm reading a book a course in a course in miracles a course in miracles mm -hmm. it was a course in miracles it was like it was written for me how come it took so <laughs> long for me to find out i'm 65. i know kenneth and you said on on trisha barker's show that you, you only really like you've lived your whole life with this knowledge and you've never really shared it um, and then recently over the last few years, you found other near death experiences and conferences and like a whole new world has been revealed to you, which is so beautiful. Yeah. That oh, you're sort of, you've come into this, you know, the, the team, the tribe, the, you know, the, the network of, uh, people that are more tuned into the, the, the miracles, the course in miracles. Yeah. Yeah. It was just I written went, for you. <laughs> I went on. Loneliness and the trial was I had to never forget that God was there. Yeah, even though you now, didn't have people around you, sat, you know, affirming your story, saying, yes, we understand you, we right. believe you. You had to say, stay right. strong in your belief, which was a bit of a test for you, I think. Yeah, now, yeah, go on. And early in my adult life, when I started talking about it, uh, my parents weren't real sure. Yeah, I bet. They weren't real sure about it. But the more I talked, the more they understood. Mm -hmm. Finally, when, when my, uh, my dad on his deathbed, he couldn't talk, but he had a stroke, he couldn't talk, but I know he was listening. So I just talked to him and I said, you know, dad, I, I know you can't talk, but I'm going to tell you my near death story again, because mm -hmm. I just like talking with you. And I told him the whole story again. And uh, so I told him, dad, when you pass on, it's not a terrible thing. Actually, you're going to enjoy it very much. Mm -hmm. And I said, when you get up there, when you separate from your body, you go up there, you're going to see your grandparents again. All those friends and relatives that you missed all these years, they're waiting for you. And it's going to be a celebration, I promise. Mm -hmm. Just hang on, Dad. It's going to be okay. And, you know, I didn't know for sure, but he seemed to understand. Mm -hmm. He died like a champion. Oh, beautiful. He, he laid there. He, I, I saw his weakness when I was a kid, so I wasn't so sure he's going to be able to handle it. But he laid there in bed, and it was like when it was time to go, he was like, he took a breath, closed his eyes, and that was it. He went. He was ready. Lovely. Yeah, lovely. It was hard for my mother. Yeah. He was fine. Um, so after... After he died, I'm sorry, I'm take, telling you a side story, but this is important. Yeah, it's okay. So after he died, my family was really upset. I felt all the sorrow. Um, I didn't cry. Mm. I felt like I needed to support my family, my mother, my sister, my brother. I needed, uh, 
uh, they kind of wanted to be left alone. They wanted to be alone, you know, to deal with their sorrow. For some reason, I was sent up to my parents' church, the same church I went to as a kid. Mm -hmm. I went up to that church, and I suddenly realized I need some alone time, too. I walked up to the altar, and I knelt, and I just dropped everything. I just sort of waved my arms, and I said, Lord, my father is gone. Please forgive me if I've done wrong. Sorry. Please forgive me if I've done wrong. And a booming voice, God spoke to me. And he said, <laughs> he said, behold my son of whom I'm proud. And it thundered. I was alone in that church and it thundered. Behold my son of whom I'm proud. And I looked up, I couldn't see anything, but I knew that there was a whole host of people watching me and they were very happy. And ever since then though, my dad has talked to me when I really need support or something has happened that I really need help. He talks to me, he gives me relief. Nice. So I was really sad when, when mom was dying and my family was really disrupted for a while. It was awful when we had to sell all of our things. And I was alone in her house. And um, I came home one night and I was extremely sad. And I was at questioning, you know, should I be here? I mean, this is where I grew up in his mom's house and it's not sold yet, but should I even be here? And my, my dad's voice came to me and he just said, welcome home, son. <laughs> just like he always used to. Welcome home, son. And I was like, Oh, thank you. So it's okay if I stay here? All right, I will. Because I don't want to pay a hotel. <laughs> so. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, so, to me. so Well, they all talk to us. They all talk to us. That's, that's the message I try to get across with the show. You don't have to have had a near-death experience or be psychic or be a guru or, or even spiritual to have your dead friends talk to you. You just have to be open and know that they do. It's really easy. Yeah. It's real easy. I'd like, to, I'd like to clarify something. When God said, "Behold, my son," He didn't say, "I'm His only son." He yeah, said, yeah, 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 yeah. And I want people to know that I'm not trying to claim there's anything special about me. Well, Quite I frankly, have a, I, I have a different perspective of um, what we understand as God. Do you want to hear it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I was do. sitting, in, I was sitting in bed one night understanding that God is the infinite field, you know, the unified field, the infinite realm of all possibility, not uh, tethered or attached to an identity, especially a man, you know, with a gray beard. <laughs> Sorry. But, you know, the, the sort of the vision we've been given of God, uh, that, that he's beyond identity, which Peter Panagor talked about when he was in that realm. And, and so, if we look at the universe and the multiverse and the infinity that is um, experience uh, like planets and universes, it's just so vast and so huge and just so unfathomable yeah. from our linear minds perspective. Right. You know, what is the part of God that is personally involved with this tiny life that is mine? When you look at the expansion of like all these millions and trillions and quadrillions and of lives, in the universe that is not just human lives, but ET lives and in different realms and astral lives. And it's just so huge, right? So what part of God, you know, who do we pray to when we pray to God? And they said, well, your higher self, of course. And I go, oh, of course. So this thing that we call God, this light that we call God, is that aspect of us that lives beyond identity. And... Um, it's not our soul, it's our higher self. It is that combination of all the lives we've lived. And it is that energy, that light, if you like, that is that direct extension of the source that is personally involved in us. And um, I went, ah, oh, oh, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so that was just a conversation like, I was having like, with the mob one night. <laughs> mm. And as there's more of us that relate to God and end up going back to him, expands 
He's getting more powerful all the time. And evil, what we call Satan, is trying to dissuade and uh, deceive people and build his strength as well, but he's not as good at it. That's what yeah, I feel. That, that's, God yeah. will eventually get so powerful that that angel I saw will be called to use his sword and blow his horn. The final battle is going to take place. And Well, that's yeah. looking at all this from a very linear mind perspective in that we've kind of placed... We've placed identity yeah. on good and evil, and then we've kind of, you know, built up a story around war, like the fight of good and evil. It's not really where I go uh, with um, what I believe. Uh, I understand that we all come to experience contrast, and the contrast we experience evolves us as a soul, and mm -hmm. um, we can't, from that realm, experience this contrast. We can't experience evil. Uh, when we're in that place of what we call heaven. So we elect to sort of experience it, to know. Mm -hmm. Somebody said to me online the other day, many people have said it to me, but just a client, like, why do, we, why do we bother? Why do we come? And I said, well, the analogy is that if you live in a hot place that's a constant degrees, like 30 degrees Celsius, I'm talking, um, all the time and you've never been to a cold place, how do you really know what hot feels like until you go to the cold place? Like how do you, yeah. how do you really experience something unless you experience the opposite of it or know the opposite of it? And I think that that's what we're doing here in mm -hmm. this realm, in this earth, experiencing the opposite of what we call love, which is called fear. How much of it we want to experience? I think we've kind of been marinating in it for quite a while and we're a bit of, um, it's a bit Groundhog Day at the moment. <laughs> Mm -hmm. so we need to change change it up a bit change the story and i think that that's what, exactly what we're doing so uh yeah. yeah so we could use that story of you know the angel is fighting the evil that's one way of explaining it well it's a very religious mm. description i suppose um and i don't know why i was shown it in that context but that's again you're you were the eight-year-old boy yeah. You know, you were being shown an eight-year-old mind was being shown something that you could understand and grown up with your Christian mom and it's something that right. you could understand. But so since that time, apart from yakking with dad, have you sort of had other visions or experiences in that realm or out-of-body experiences? Um, I used to be able to meditate and leave my body. Okay. Um, but... As I get older, I don't, I don't do that. I now it's, it's mostly I get um, dreams that are prophetic. Right. If something, mm -hmm. if something really serious and terrible is going to happen, like I was having really prophetic dreams right before nine eleven. Right. Um, so I saw plane crashes and buildings burning and falling down, and mm -hmm. and then the event happened, and then I knew it. Mm -hmm. uh, there was the, the tsunami that happened in Indonesia mm -hmm. around 2004 or five. 2004, yeah, it was the end. It was just after Christmas. I think it was Boxing Day 2004. I remember exactly where yeah. I was. Yeah, I had a, I had a very prophetic dream about that before it happened. Mm -hmm. um, although I did not see the tsunami that hit Japan, mm -hmm. which is which is weird. But that I was did huge. Not. Yeah. But I saw a terrible hurricane hit Louisiana. It was mm -hmm. Katrina. Yeah. I saw a terrorist bombing that took place in Madrid. Um, Did you uh, see the pandemic? Well, you know, I saw a lot of people suffering and dying. But I thought it was because of war or, or maybe because of storms. But... Boy, this pandemic is sure is starting to look like it. I oh, saw, I've got I saw a different pockets of people. I think a I lot of people pockets, suffered. Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. I saw pockets of people dying like in major cities. Because from up above, uh, it was like, uh, you know how a city looks at night from a satellite with all the lights? Mm -hmm. Well, I was told when you see a light, that's when the spirit separates and leaves the body. So I saw pockets of people dying and all lit just like a nighttime view of all the streetlights but I saw pockets of people dying so 
it would light up over the continent. And uh, I knew that people were dying, that's all. So have you been shown any prophetic things that have been positive? <laughs> I've been talking about the bad stuff so much. Boy, you've really challenged me. Oh, I did. After the chaos, I saw a group of people living very spiritual lives, um, very peaceful lives, very simple lives, uh, working in their gardens, um, living in simple structures, and they were very happy. So there is a good ending. And I was, I was told, it was like, we showed you a lot of disruption, but this is the result. So all the trial and error that we're going to go through is going to result in us being much happier people. Mm -hmm. now, I don't know if it's because the proverbial Jesus has come back to earth or if it's because we elevated ourselves spiritually. But all I know is those people were very happy. Mm -hmm. So we can look forward to that. Mm -hmm. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, so mm -hmm. to speak. And so maybe perhaps the reason why I'm here is maybe I'm supposed to share what I know and maybe encourage people to think a little more spiritually, maybe try to self-develop. Um, I, I believe that every single human being has the same ability to manipulate time and space um, and to separate from the body and to be somewhat like Jesus if we just develop it, we test it, we try it. So I tell people, learn how to meditate. And if you can do it so well that you can separate from your body, good for you. You're on the right track. Well, we don't actually need to separate from our body. Uh, you know, we don't, in order to live heaven, we don't need to actually die and go there. We can, you know, be it here. You know, I wrote a book called Return to Love about my experiences with death and the other side. And, and uh, returning to love, you know, you don't have to die to return to love. You know, the fastest, somebody said to me, the fastest way back to spirit is through death, but you don't have to die to get there. You know, right. you, can, you can be in spirit and still be in your body. And I think that that's the challenge we're all facing at the moment. Can we live that perspective from heaven's perspective, all is well and I am love, and still be inside the drama and in the physical body? You know, can we feel that freedom and that love that people experience when they're out of their bodies mm -hmm. while still being in the body. I don't think we've right. all come here to be in bodies to leave, um, to experience love. I think we came here to be in bodies to experience love inside what it is yeah. to be human, physical. Yeah. And I've seen people on earth that um, just amaze me. I had a roommate who had a lovely mother and she had a huge family. And I was a visitor at their house one night, I slept on the couch, and in the middle of the night, one of her grandchildren got really sick, this grandmother. And she took this grandchild and held it in her arms and took care of it all night long. And I would go in and out of sleep, and I woke up one time and I saw her rocking the baby, who she healed, by the way. She put some medicine on this baby's throat because it was sick. And it healed the baby and it could breathe again and it just slept. And she was holding the baby and singing to it and I woke up. She had a blue aura. She was completely Beautiful. blue. Beautiful. Mm. This old woman. Mother. And there was mm. like a blue light out the kitchen window that shone through on her. Mm. She was, the floor was lit. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to sleep and I woke up in the morning. She was still there holding the baby and she was still blue. Mm. So that woman was powerful. Um, now, if you think I'm a heavy critic of Catholics, I am to point. She was Catholic. Mm. She was well, also Polish. Well, if she's Polish Catholic, we're all powerful. We're all powerful. Yeah. All we have to do is Every remember that. Us. Every one of us. It, yeah. Religion is great as long as we don't worship the religion. We get caught up in our religions and we worship the religion. What is that all about? Religion is created by mankind. No, we're each individually very powerful people. Mm. We, could use, we could use religion to help give us focus and give us 
um, a community that we can work together with and we can mm -hmm. support each other through a church. Mm -hmm. And that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. But we each have an individual connection to God that we can recognize and we can use. And it goes beyond our religion. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I watched a great movie on Netflix. Now, what was it called? St. Francis? It was a true story about a um, priest that took on this old church in a country town in America. And um, the, it, it wasn't a Catholic church. It was because uh, he was married, uh, another type. And uh, mm -hmm. they wanted to shut the church because they couldn't afford it. And, he, oh. and it had all this land behind it. And he, he said, well, let's plant vegetables and... Um, uh, and try and raise some money. Anyway, it was a bit of a drama that they all went through, but it's a beautiful story. I think it's called Saint, Saint Something or Other. It's about the church. And they actually filmed it in the very place that the real story took place. Uh, oh. Yeah, huh? it's beautiful. Uh, Kenneth, thank you so much for being on the show and sharing your story with us and um, for putting up with all the internet interruptions and the crazy things that have been going on. I enjoyed the conversation. If, if you're ever in Nebraska, you better stop. Stop and knock on the door. I'll stop and say hi, for sure. Yeah, I'll, get, I'll give you a beer and we'll sit down and talk. <laughs> Big love. Yes, love you. Love your family and love everyone around you. Oh, well, that was fascinating. Another NDE, Herb. So interesting to hear different people's uh, near-death experiences and their different perspectives and mm, coming from a, a religious background. That was really fascinating. I think I wanted to talk to Kenneth because I wanted to hear about his, um, apart from his experience in, in heaven, as we spoke about the uh, what he was shown about earth, the future of earth. But I think a lot of the stuff that he was shown has already happened. Uh, I can imagine there's going to be a bit of comments about the Trump stuff. <laughs> it gets a bit political. Everyone has their different ideas about Trump, good or bad. Anything that's happening, whether it's a politician that you love or hate, or a controlling system that's lying to us or a pandemic that's crossing the world it's not what's happening to us it's how we're responding to it that makes the difference how are we responding to what's happening are we remembering that we are loved and all is well are we remembering that we are love and that we can live that love and not be inside the fear regardless of what's happening. That's the test. That's the challenge. That's what we've all signed up for as humans. We came into a polarized, contrasting environment to challenge ourselves. Can I remember who I am while living the earth experience, while living the earth drama and all the fear and all the worry and all the concern? Can I stay loving, stay present, not be in the worry too much? Ah, oh, the worry is kind of getting out of control. I've had a few people contact me. Um, and seeing that worry, they're worried about, you know, viruses going around the internet and that's shutting down. You know, that is a concern to be, to not get hit by a computer virus. Isn't it funny that we've got this, this so-called coronavirus that we're all worried about and then someone called me yesterday and she's worried about a computer virus. It's still the virus fear, isn't it? The virus fear. And I said to her, you know, with every link that we receive, because people are sending crazy links on, um, crazy amount of links and memes and stuff on Facebook Messenger, to me anyway, um, and a lot of other people, a friend of mine <laughs> posted on her Facebook, please stop sending me messages, I've had enough, because <laughs> everyone's sending stuff. If we're worried about computer viruses, before you open anything, just ch tune in. Just tune in with yourself. Is this, is this something I need to watch? I often delete stuff that I'm getting. No, nope, that's no good. Don't need to open that. Uh, or if, if someone sends it to me that I trust and love and I get a bit suspicious about the link, I will contact that person directly, either through Messenger or, or, or on their phone or on their wall and say, did you send me this link? And quite often people say, no, no, I've been hacked. I don't open it, don't open it. Uh, so we have to rely on that intuition and guidance in every circumstance, whether it's computer viruses or whatever, so that when people are sending you stuff on the internet or through emails, just tune in. Is this something that I need to open? And if you feel uneasy about it, just don't. 
and either delete it or question the person that sent it to you. Um, email them back or message them back. Did you send this to me? Is this safe to watch? Is... Yeah, so we don't have to be fearful and concerned. We can just tune in to our brilliance, to our knowing, to our connection. And that lives outside of fear. That lives outside of fear. So alleviate the fear first before you tune in to asking your mob or your guides answers. Because very often when we're inside fear and we ask questions, um, we get fearful answers back because we're getting our own fear thoughts back. So you have to alleviate the fear, find the peace, meditate. What I did last night when someone rang me with all her concerns is when I got off the phone, uh, I was kind of shaken because I had taken on her energy. And then I was saying to myself, okay, it's not her fault that I'm shaken. It's my fault for taking on her fear because she was like very fearful, but talking to me in a very soft, reasonably, you know, responsible way. But inside this sort of reason, there was so much fear. And so I'm sort of running around the house yesterday, walking around the house saying, shake it off, shake it off, shake it off. And I actually did... Um, you know, some exercises of connecting to the light, asking my energy, how much of the energy am I carrying right now is me? I've got 50%. So I'm carrying 50% of energy that's not mine, which I'm feeling as this anxiety, like I was feeling sh literally shaken. And I just sent it, I just thanked it for traveling with me. Thank you. Thank you, anxiety. Thank you, fear, for attaching to my auric field. And I just send you off to the light, or as Michael Tamora says, send it into a rose. Like send that energy into a rose, don't resist it, love it, send that energy into the rose, send that rose out into space and explode it or explode the rose. And uh, so that's what I did last night and it profoundly shifted my energy. Um, but we've got to remember not to blame the person that gives you like lumps all their fear on you because it's our responsibility whether we take the fear. And I think that in my concerns for her, uh, a personal friend, I had taken on her fear and then I was suffering for it. Um, but I was just reminding myself, it's your fault, Karen, it's your fault. She might be fearful, but you've taken it on and you can do something about it. So that's exactly what I did. And it's in that place of releasing that fear, finding peace. So what I did after that is I watched funny memes or I just watched things that made me laugh or lit me up to sort of bring back the joy again instead of this anxiety that I was feeling after having this conversation with her. And then all was well after that. Yeah, I had a good night's sleep, <laughs> so it was good. Yes, crazy times. Hope you're all well and learning how to deal with the fear of yours and others. Remember that there is plenty of help, either physically or spiritually, um, helping us reconnect, 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 stay connected alleviate release our fears transmute the fear so um, if you need any help doing that uh, i'm available drop me a line book in for a session join our inner sanctum tribe jeff o'driscoll's coming up this week he's a beautiful man and very connected to the light It'd be lovely to hear what he has to say about the crazy that's happening in the world and stay loving love you all Bye for now.